Get ready to dive into a world where empires stand on the brink of war and terrible monsters tear at the fragile borderlands of men. The Adventurer Conqueror King System Imperial Imprint, or as we like to call it, Axe 2, is now live on Kickstarter. Axe 2 is the new edition of the acclaimed best-selling fantasy role-playing game. You'll find everything you need to enjoy epic fantasy campaigns with a sweeping scope. Whether you want to crawl through dungeons, experiment with alchemy, crossbreed monsters, run a merchant emporium, raise an undead legion, or even conquer an empire, Axe 2 supports your playstyle. Axe 2 integrates experience point mechanics, making campaign activities a seamless part of the core gameplay loop. Your character levels up in new and exciting ways each time you play, adding massive replayability to each of your adventures. Axe 2 offers 18 character classes, 378 spells, new combat mechanics, and so much more. Support Axe 2 on Kickstarter today. We we're doing a special mid-campaign interview with each player's one-on-one -on -one to discuss kind of like where they're at as players. I'm going to start with Kobo, who is our guest. We're joined here by Danny Dennison. Hello. I was like, should I do character voice or should I not do character voice? No, this is not character voice time. <laughs> I'm a person. I'm a person. I have just 10 questions for you here. I figured we could kind of discuss how you felt about... Kobo, now exiting, how did you feel about your character's progression in the campaign? What were the particular milestones and moments that really, like, stood out to you as you played Kobo? Kobo started out a little rougher than I thought. Like, the very first ep episode was, like, good. You know, he's just introducing himself good. But then, like, I was struggling to figure out how Kobo was meshing with the group. Because it's so hard with, like, them having episode on episode of, like, back chemistry, story you know? and yeah. chemistry. Yeah, so it's like, how do I mesh in this without it feeling forced, right? Because, mm -hmm. like, you know, obviously Kobo was, like, invested in what they were doing. Totally, yeah. And so, like, that was helpful. But it's like, where does he actually start to feel like he fits in? And so it was like a little flat for a little bit. But then I feel like I was particularly able to start to mesh once I decided to have Kobo talk with Celine. Right. And Brooke did like a fantastic job like bouncing off that. And then I would say another big one would be like Marissa's interactions with Kobo as a Femia. Mm -hmm. We're just like very like personal, mm -hmm. I guess, like yeah. at a high level, especially near the end where Kobo really started to feel like he was part of this group. He was really helping not throw Grom under the bus, but he's just like, I'm Grom. <laughs> Tough guy. But no, he actually, actually, I, I got I to backpedal that a little bit because I do remember listening to a couple of the episodes and remembering him actually have some supportive lines and stuff. And we had the whole Grometh moment. Oh, yeah. I feel like that was one of, to me, one of the things that stuck out like a lot. The polymorph battle was very fun with like, yeah. the, no, your yeah. left foot. Like, I really enjoyed <laughs> that. Actually, yeah, I think that was like, just as like a solo character, even though it's still like, he was like still a little distant from the group at that time that was like definitely some highlight moments for Kobo to be able to show his like more non-violent side but in a fun way very yeah. much enjoyed that follow up on that looking back on Kobo's progression if you could right now give kind of advice to past Danny mm. what would have been the things that you could have like told past Danny to try and iron out the growing pains at the beginning with uh, kind of, like like you said, like not necessarily meshing with yeah. the group and like the chemistry that they had and trying to like enmesh yourself into the group. What would you say to past Danny? I would say like maybe focus a little less on like just Kobo roleplay moments because it's like, oh, like what would be like a fun comment by Kobo or what would be like a rhyme he could think of and just spending the whole time thinking of those for like these moments and just be like, if something good happens Happens. I feel like interacting with the other players is like so easily missed out on like just I could have complimented Grom on like how well he did as a mammoth even though you killed far too many goblins you know like, <laughs> like you, I disapprove of your actions but great job like <laughs> wow you were incredible but there was so much blood <laughs> you know something just to like call attention to like yeah. good moments you and characters have rather than always thinking like what's your character's next moment to shine like when can I be like a plus one to a moment I right. guess if that makes sense especially when trying to newly find your way into a group 
Yeah. I really enjoyed having Kobo as part of, like, as a guest in the group. Uh, I sprung it on you last minute. I was really appreciative that you just decided to jump on board day of and come record with us. So thank you for that. But because I did ask you so last minute, I can't help but to feel like I could have better prepared you for what was to come with your character. As Kobo, do you feel like there was any missed out storylines or storylines that you wished you kind of would have further developed or explored in order for you to feel kind of more at peace with Kobo? Like, what what regrets do you have, almost, of, of storylines that could have been? Yeah. Um, one was, like, that Kobo didn't even go in and try to talk to Litsy. Oh, right. Because he was trying to, like, make peace in the region, and then he just, like, kind of let that go, like, really quick. I mean, of course, like, in my head, I was thinking, like, we'll come back to this, you know, True. something. Or, like, you know, there might be another moment, but it's like, that was, like, a key moment where I just let Zag go in and talk. Not to say it was bad, because, like, it was good to have Zag have his moment, so it was kind of hard for Kobo to fit that, but I was like, that just didn't quite fit his character. I wish I would have found a way to roleplay that out better. Or, like, yeah. maybe even, like, just call attention to, like, oh, like, I had this goal, but I guess it'll have to wait. Something simple yeah. like that. Well, because we got the Kobold and Bullywug kind of like team up with Kobo combining the kobolds and bullywugs with Kobo being both of their leaders now now that the party killed Granny D and the Big Bonito was defeated. I, I was gonna say yeah the ending of Kobo because I was definitely worried about his like trajectory particularly with the blood madness we were talking right. about. I was like how is this gonna come out? Do I want it to do the right way? And like I kept having Kobo lose control but then it started to feel like it was too much so I started to get worried it would like not come across the way it was supposed to. But the ending just... It, it really ended up coming together really nicely, and yeah. I was glad. But, yeah, so we got them together, but we still don't have, like, solid peace with the goblins With yet. the goblins, right. So that's, like... But if you had talked to Litzy, that could have been potentially... Right, so I kind of regret not at least trying for that a little bit more when we were right next to her, or at right. least calling attention to that was one of my goals. But I did get to, like, make a little bit of a note on it at the end, like, oh, like, first thing to do is, like, we're gonna go, like, send an envoy to the goblins or yeah, something. Uh -huh. In the end, I'm very pleased with how the character arc came together so quickly... Oh, yeah. For, like, the little mini, like, guest session. I don't know if it'd be very easy to replicate that with, like, another guest player. I agree. No, I really think that Kobo had a lot of great standout moments. Thinking outside of Kobo, as we talked about, like, Kobo ended with being the, the king of the bullywugs and the kobolds, and now you're basically two of, you're a fourth of, of the uh, influential people <laughs> needed for the end of the campaign. What do you think are the party's odds of winning this final battle on a scale of like Ooh. one to ten one being tpk town ten being total cakewalk what things do you think the party isn't necessarily planning on what things do you think might go really well for the party etc yeah okay i'm gonna say i think there are very slim odds of things going like perfect like right. having like the really good ending i'm kind of feeling like as we're coming up to it the prep work the like connections with all the different groups are, are pretty solid for a lot of them but like uh, i don't know they haven't had a lot of time to like coordinate what the plan is going right. into the end it's kind of feeling just like they're going in a little like run and gun so i'm feeling like they have pretty good odds of like a success but i think they're going to struggle to have like the outcome they they want exactly they might yeah. have to, the like, perfect settle, ending, yeah. if you will. Uh -huh. So I'm going to give them like 70% of the perfect ending. 70? Like, so like a 7? Yeah, like they're coming in like pretty solid, Yeah, but they're not like... They're not, like, above and beyond prepared. What would be things that you think would make that 7 go from a 7 to a 10, where it would be more of a cakewalk? What Ooh. do you think the party could have maybe done differently in order to be better prepared for the ending? Oh, I think they could have tried to pry from River how to contact Ephemia's mom a little harder. Right. Maybe I, I might have actually been a little late to that session, so I wonder if they, they did. But I feel like they talked about her a lot, but they didn't actually try to start coordinating yet. Yeah. 
with the Seldarine Avengers. And I feel like that should be a high priority because right now they have no idea what they're actually supposed to do to help. Right. They know they need the army, but they don't know like what it is to use it for, where they need to be, how to gather them. And that'll probably come together, but there's a lot of unknowns sitting on the table. So I think more information gathering, not uh, obviously easier said than done, though. Definitely. Honestly, I think the parties missed a lot of plot points that they could have maybe uh, delved in a little deeper, which we may or may not be discussing later in this interview. I mean, I think in the end it'll work out. Like you said, a 7 out of 10, that's above 50%, you know? I agree with you that they have done a lot that has helped them. I mean, it's hard for me to say, I'm the DM, I have all this information. Information that the party doesn't have, necessarily, unless they deep dive into the lore of the world like I do. Like, no, can't you remember? Season one, episode (laughs) two, we talked about this thing. That's applicable here. (laughs) Can't you see the connection? (laughs) I'm sitting with the the yarn. But yeah, Yeah. no. Nonetheless, I will say, but, but I mean, obviously, there's so much to do. So many, like, they're focused on hitting the big pivot points. Like, okay, we just need the the like people and armies our allies but like you know from a backseat as like Kobo kind of comes in a little later and is like leaving now it's easy to sit and like be like oh but like what about what you're actually doing with these groups right. or how to actually get in contact and coordinate with the Seldarine Avengers so it'll be interesting to see if they can like get that information and coordinate everything effectively yeah And I think, like we're saying, being a DM or even being a character in the podcast, you kind of are interweaving this web of knowledge, even if you're not thinking about what has happened in the past and how it might affect the future. Those things in the past might stick with players and affect their decisions in the future. You are kind of in like a interesting position being the only person who's guested in this campaign. What things do you think your character did in the game that will have a lasting impact on the party that will change the outcome. Had Kobo not been in the campaign versus Kobo being in the campaign, what things do you think your character has had an impact on in the party to change their outcome? Oh, it's hard to say. I mean, obviously, like, the big impact is, like, becoming allies with them and then becoming the powerful leader of both races. So that's, like, the big impact. It's like, now, like... I can make sure you guys have what you need to protect the realm. Right. Kobo's hopes is definitely that he, like, instilled some wisdom. I kind of like to have his poems be a little, like, arbitrary or, like, a little bit too, like, a little floaty. So, like, he kind of thinks of himself as, like, you know, a wise sage. So, yeah. obviously, I, I think the group is, like, a little bit more built in their ways. And so they're harder to influence than Kobo would uh, anticipate but a little bit I do think and Kobo even more so thinks that hopefully he helps set them off on a little bit less of a violent path even though a lot of things ended up violent but by starting working with Granny D they developed better relationship with her made it a little bit easier for her to realize she could give them her boon Mm -hmm. even on death and I mean honestly it seems like Zag had probably been thinking about this for a while so it probably would have went that way with Litzy anyways but like there's a high chance like some of the other group members might have pushed towards just fighting Litzy true and so like Kobo's like kind of hope is just that like he set things off a little bit on a more like cooperative path I agree work with more of the like big players even the semi bad ones to reach a better outcome than just kill them all and hope somebody better takes their places like yeah. leaders of the region we had two kind of like losses while while Kobo was around we had the river fight and we had the uh, Aserak Jr. fight river escaped and so did Aserak Jr. and yeah. even though it didn't end in any party deaths uh, like with Granny D things are definitely changing for the party and I think it's nice that Kobo was kind of there to shepherd in this new era of like yes you can fight everything but that doesn't mean you're gonna win everything yeah. so sometimes it's just better to try and like talk it out before it gets to the point where death is on the line for your characters yeah it it definitely was cool to be able to have some like failures and have them like work out as like adding to the campaign it's interesting sorry on that note that uh rivers was like a character we all hated way more but his defeat feels so much less intense than 
Acerax for some reason. As I was just thinking about it, I guess it's because like Rivers is almost less of a defeat and more like a victory with conditions or yeah. like a half victory. <laughs> Because you basically we beat got, him to to run. Yeah, you know? which means we got the like the headquarters back or the casino. Yeah. And like kind of usurped him of his like throne of terror. And so like that one like honestly didn't feel as bad. It's like shoot, he got away. Oh well, hopefully he doesn't do terrible things later. Yeah. But Asterax was like we were emotionally vested in just stopping him in that moment, and it wasn't just that like he got away, but like he got away. He got to take all the bodies. And it wasn't like we were more powerful and he ran. It was like we couldn't even, like, think about fighting him. Mm -hmm. Just brutal. So it was definitely interesting. I'm excited to see, like, because that's coming. That's going to come back up. You know, like yeah. at some point they've got to they've got to deal with that. And whether they do it, you know, in the in campaign or post campaign, it might have some different variables on, on whether they are successful or not. And not only that, but a Serac Jr. is a lich and the big bad of the campaign being Vecna is also a lich. And I would dare say a more powerful lich. So it's kind of interesting to think of a Serac Jr. as maybe some tales to come for the party some uh something to learn from as they are going into this next section of the campaign all right danny the rest of these questions i'm going to save for our patreon after show so if you are a patreon member and you're listening to it on our patreon you can expect to hear the second half of this interview at the end of the episode but we're going to move on to our next interviewee which is alec my older brother so we're now joined here by Alec, uh, who Please. played Zag in this campaign. I'm very excited uh, to interview my brother. Yeah. So thank you for being here. How do you feel about your character's progress in this campaign so far? Are there any particular milestones or moments that you feel like stand out for Zag as a character? I feel very happy with Zag's progress, but it was not what I expected it to be. I created a character that I thought would be fun to play, I didn't think would have as much depth. Like, I didn't realize how many story arcs my character would go through. Even probably more than anybody else's. I would would say, yeah, Zag's probably had the most arcs. I definitely think so. Which I didn't expect. So that's been very fun to develop. I I mean, I feel like I still keep the, like, same energy that I had at the beginning, but he's been through a lot of dark things for a happy, you know, positive character. Yeah. You know, the Discord has plenty to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fan theories on that. Yeah. But um, I know I feel really good about how he progressed. It just was nothing like I expected it to be. Like becoming one of the eight or, I mean, like I kind of felt like my main, when I wrote the character, the main uh, motivation and everything was finding the brother and just that was it. Yeah. And it has progressed into like so many further steps like Shadowfell imprisonment and... The sh- you know the shadow snipping and multi-classing and a sorcerer none of that was planned so that's been kind of interesting marissa's gonna love this answer um as far as like major things i feel like i've made some very campaign changing decisions yeah big moves <laughs> big moves also maybe more than anybody yeah I would dare also say. most of them not planned most yeah. of them <laughs> most of them were like i have an idea and i'm just gonna you know, we're run with it. For it. We're yeah. just gonna run with it. So that's been kind of fun. Um, I feel like uh, my character has not only made a lot of progress himself, but I've made very <laughs> campaign-altering decisions and made, for better or for worse, change the trajectory of the game. Yeah, which is kind of cool. Oh, definitely. In ways, sometimes I, I, I worry that I'm like ruining things, but at no, the same time, no. it's like I am making a huge impact impact on how like this turns out. No, and I think you've had a lot of growth as like a D and D player in general. I mean, I know you did the the whole Himbo's Guide on our Patreon, and I I know that you've said that that's helped a lot. And sitting yeah. next to Mason, I mean, oh, Brooke, Brooke can attest. Like she was like, I hardly knew how to play D and D, and then I sat next to Mason for Campaign One, and now I'm good. Like, yeah, yeah, he helps a lot. <laughs> he's he, yeah, he's a very helpful resource. So uh, thank you to Mason whenever you hear this. I actually find it funny because prior to the campaign, we had talked about you having potentially an an evil twin, right? Yes. And we had talked about the potential of your character dying at some point. Yeah. Oh, I forget about that. 
resume resume playing as Thorn. You're, really, you're willing instead. to drop that right now? Yeah, yeah. You haven't said it to anybody else. <laughs> no, so it's just no. It, I've I've only told I've I've told a couple of our like higher paying right. patrons. Mm-hmm. Like Kate gave me the option to resume game as Thorn yeah. when the whole Shadowfell thing went down, and I said no. Mm-hmm. But I did have <laughs> I did have the option yeah. of just screwing everybody well, and just resuming play as an evil version of my character. That would have looked the same, you know, like identical twin, you know. No so. one would have known the difference. So I'm, I will throw out there all the uh, Discord fan theories. You are on the right track because it could have gone that way. I just Alec yeah. chose not to, mm-hmm. but it could have. I, I find it interesting choice. that they like sussed it out though. They like the, did. I don't the feel like it was that obvious. No, but apparently no. they're I mean, like. Apparently it is was. it Thorn? And I'm like it. It could have been. Was <laughs> I know I, I I and the only reason it wasn't because I told Cade before we started you can kill Zag mm-hmm. if I can resume as Thorn if it makes sense for the story. But if it doesn't make sense for the story, I want to play Zag. And so we had a session it, that we were almost like, it almost makes sense for Zag to die right here. And then I remember you being like, yeah, I'm cool with it. And then you calling me like 30 minutes later saying like, I want to keep playing Zag though. Like, <laughs> yeah, I can't let him I, die. <laughs> as, soon as, I, as soon as I said the words, you, know, you get connected to your characters. I, 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 I regretted it. I wanted to keep playing him. I feel like I play him well. Yep. I just wanted to keep going. Yep. So yeah, Alex's selfishness is the reason that I'm not evil. <laughs> well, looking back on your character's development and, uh, you know, all the changes that were made and we kind of discussed like prior to podcast what aspects of their personality or abilities like with your multi-class and other things have been do you think the most fun to explore as a player oh baby shadow thorn for sure oh yeah that was never a plan right that was never even a, a thought that i would have any form i mean he's not technically even a familiar he's really nothing he doesn't actually benefit zag like he's flavor like, like uh, he's flavor everything that baby shadow thorn does Zag could do without Baby Shadow Thorn. I just decide I'm going to use Baby Shadow Thorn to do it. Yeah. That's probably been my favorite or like funnest thing to play as far as like developments in the character. Right. Even though it actually doesn't do anything. <laughs> I just enjoy I enjoy it. I just I don't know. Yeah. It's no, fun for I, me. I think it, it fits super well with the campaign, fits su- super well with your character. It's very fun flavor because even though, yeah, Thorn was evil, now at this point, like, Zag's a good guy. And so, like. I have an evil an evil character that yeah. does my bidding yeah. as a good person. And, and I don't feel like we even touch enough on Thorn could have been probably the BBEG. Oh, totally. Had we not intervened. Yeah, if you guys had not gone and gone to the realm of Thorn, I was planning on him having an impact on the end of the game. So and the, now he's just like my little pet. Now he's just your buddy, you <laughs> he's know? He's just my little bro. <laughs> I'm like, baby shadow, Thorn's going to do this stupid thing. <laughs> you know? The potential BBEG is my buddy. He's my bro, <laughs> and he responds to everything I say. I Speaking think that's Speaking of kind of like storylines and and quests that your character has like developed that you might not have anticipated what do you feel like could have been further developed or explored things that maybe you didn't touch upon that you wish kind of you would have gone farther and uh had liked to have seen them unfold differently i have two answers number one the way i built the character i don't love how there has become like a distrust of him. I mean, it mostly right, stems right. from Marissa and Ephemia, and it is it is <laughs> warranted. Right. But the way I built the character and envisioned him would be more like, yes, he's naive, but he is a strong leader. Yeah. And so that's kind of been something that, not that I wish had developed better or more, but more I don't, not even that I dislike it, it just developed differently than I expected, that yeah. there's... It, rather than I thought I was going to be not necessarily a heroic character, but just kind of like a genuine good light to the the story. And so it's different than I expected that he's not necess- like like he is, but at the same time, he isn't like there is. Yeah. There is like a seed of distrust among the party on when Zag does things because I am a chaotic player trying to play a non-chaotic character. Yeah. It's shining through. The joke that has uh, emerged in our group with, this is my best idea yet, and, and I'm then... Gonna, I'm gonna screw you all. And then everything goes <laughs> down the toilet. Yeah. Like, like. That was not my plans. I kind I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't say I wish it progressed differently, 
but at the same time it wasn't what i expected wasn't what it to be it wasn't how i anticipated playing the character yeah. and how he developed the other thing is i do and and this is more looking towards the future i want to develop the king zag right because i didn't know that was coming i didn't think it would come even though kate had told me you had told me it was like this is an option or a possibility but i didn't expect it to ever actually come because i thought i had written enough other material that it wouldn't really come to light because i told you i didn't i didn't care right if whether it happened or not it happened or not i wrote that he was an heir to a throne almost just to explain him being on the run like that was the reason i wanted him to be on the run for his like entire life to explain his current like unknowingness of the world right but that that reasoning for it wasn't because i wanted that it was because it just kind of fit yeah so looking forward the thing i think i want to develop more is like i mean even now he's like technically the king of avalar yeah but i've done nothing so i do uh, (laughs) yes so this is a future answer is i do want to develop that a little more i don't know if we'll have time yeah i honestly in this campaign but i would like to now that that's happened i want that to develop more as like zag's not just this like idiot that just fell into this thing but i would like to develop more leadership traits um like within him that are like okay he's actually gonna he's do a, for this. he yeah. is gonna do good yeah because in my mind he would be a good king with the right advisors <laughs> <laughs> hey it's worked out with but the party you, so but you know far, what i mean you know? like, like he has the, he, his heart is in the right place so i think he would do well i agree that's something i want to future develop differently well, speaking of the future and the campaign kind of, you know, winding down to a close, what do you think, Alec time, not Zag, what do you think, Alec, as what your party's chances are on a scale of one to ten on how well this end of fight is going to go? One being like TPK, ten being just total breeze, you know, you're going to backhand Vecna and it's going to be all over. I think it's a five because I think it's a 50-50 shot. Right, okay. Um, for a number of reasons. The undead, um, we can kind of address, but overall, not really. Like, there's going to yeah. be a huge force. And I, the way I'm anticipating it, Alec is anticipating it, because obviously I have thought about how this is going to go down. I think that all of the forces of the eight that we have collected will basically combat the undead, which will leave our party versus Vecna. Yeah. as like almost a separate fight like we're not like we that's kind of that's also kind of my thought too okay like, well that's good to know I that's mean, what i've assumed yeah like um i, well, I mean Vecna's i'm, I'm CR sure on a, alone i, yeah. I would feel terrible being yeah. like she like I, 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 feel like I feel like it's gonna end up on a party versus vecna fight i i think we might have to fight some undead but overall like i'm concerned about what you're doing yeah with the undead marching to Greyhaven, but I also think with us collecting forces, it's going to be almost like like balance itself. Right. To be able to get us to that final fight. Where I'm concerned and where I call it a 50-50 is, yes, we have been able to fight higher CR creatures than we should be able to, but nowhere near a 30. Definitely. I mean, Granny so, D was a 20. A 20, and, and if... And one person without, died. Without Litzy's help as well... I don't. I mean, I don't know. Maybe we. Well, technically, technically, you did it without Litzy's help. That's Litzie true. Litzy didn't do a single point of damage, and Granny D died. Yeah, like that's died outright. It's crazy. But you guys are what, say we twelve get, at that time. We're twelve or thirteen. Well, you were twelve. We're 12. Now you're thirteen. Yeah, say we of get to Vecna, yeah. though, and I mean, I cannot imagine we get beyond fifteen if we even get that high. Oh yeah, I I, I don't even know if you'll get to fourteen. Honestly, yeah, at this like point. we're close. Yeah. I think it's a I think I don't think our odds our our odds are great and I yeah. think you're willing to let us die. Oh totally. Yeah. I know you are. <laughs> Which is why I say fifty fifty because I don't have enough information to say take everything else aside, our party fights a CR thirty creature. I think it's gonna be luck of the luck of the dice. If you were to guess, so Danny was just in here. If you were to guess what his thoughts were on your guys' odds, what what would you think that Danny thinks of your party? Uh, Danny is such a good person and a good soul that makes me think he's super hopeful. Even though I'm honestly, I think I'm being, I think I'm I'm bumping my numbers because I want to be more hopeful with a 50-50. Yeah. My honest thought is it's probably less than a 50-50 chance. Ah. But Danny is such a believer. I'm going to say Danny said a 6.5. 
Ah, that, that's pretty close. <laughs> I, I won't. I won't tell you. So uh, it was a seven. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. He's. He said uh, seven, but he said that he thought it could have been a ten had your party made some different decisions along the way. He thought that you could have been a little. Uh, that you could have handled the river fight a little differently and could have potentially leveraged that to your advantage instead yeah. of having a future enemy, which is probably true. I mean, but will, Danny ri- has but great will River insight, you know? fight alongside Vecna? Right. I don't think so. You, you, yeah. he, he's an entirely selfish character. I don't think it'll benefit. It's not going to benefit us how that went, mm-hmm. but I don't think that will be our detriment. Me personally. I, I mean, time will tell, I guess. But yeah. I think I am going to cut you off there, Alec, as we're going to save the rest of your questions for the Patreon portion at the end of the episode. Thank you for joining me, Alec. Our next interviewee will be Marissa. So let's join Marissa in. We are joined here now by Marissa, who played Ophemia in Campaign 2. I don't know why I introduce it like that. Like, of course people know. If they've gotten this far in the campaign, they're like, wait, who's, who's Ophemia? They better know. <laughs> There's a character named Ephemia in there? Wait, I thought her name was Effie. <laughs> I'm working on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> eventually. So let's start things off. How do you feel about your character's progress in the campaign so far? What are the particular milestones or moments that you feel like have been kind of standout moments, like the the core memories that make Ephemia? As for how she's done so far, I have been pretty stoked on it, actually, because I know, uh, I, I mean, I'll make this public. How I came to you like two months ago, (laughs) freaking out. But I also, one of my goals from the very beginning, I should emphasize, was trying to make it realistic. I didn't want her to have like one moment where everything was all, you know, sunshine and daisies at that point. Because I I wanted to start with, you know, a little bit of a character that was a little hardened. Yeah, totally. So it's, it's been fun trying to play like little changes rather than one big significant one because I didn't want it to be that instant i wanted it to to be you know feel real and feel like somebody's changing a little bit over time granted you know for me it's been a year for her it's maybe been two weeks right yeah (laughs) so it's still been a pretty quick progression for her but for me i've I've been riding this out as for key moments for ephemia it's again kind of been a lot of the little things she bickers with zag and grom like they're her brothers Whereas before it was literally just trying to put up another barrier, be like, I don't care about you guys. And now it's like, okay, I'm telling you because you're dumb because you can do better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or how, you know, like she's slowly progressed in her friendship with Celine. And I think a big turning point for that too was also a female watching Celine die in front of her. And yeah. then just. Oh, out. I'm excited for tonight's episode. Where while prepping, I talked to Brooke today and asked, "Are you gonna bring that up?" And Brooke's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna bring it up. I died." And I'm like, "Oh yeah. man!" Oh, Brooke and I made notes at the end of last episode. We were just like pointing our screens towards each other, like, "Yeah, yeah, you were thinking this way." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. One thing that's been really interesting is just like all the points of people coming back into Ephemia's life, and it turns out like all these people she was looking for to hope that in hopes that it would like really help her point her in her direction. It did. Slow Slowly, but also, I think realizing that a lot of those characters in her history were were not the best. So it wasn't like you know, again, meeting one of those people wasn't going to be some significant change to her. And then she has a godfather like River Cade. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess along those lines, are there any potential moments that you felt like might have been lost, either with like character development, with uh, relationships? with either other characters or NPCs. You brought up River or Celine and Grom and Zag. Are there things that you wish you would have, I guess, dived deeper into in the moment that you're kind of looking back on and thinking like, ah, man, I missed that time. Yeah, so I've been re-listening to some of the early episodes, which I told you about, and catching back up. Just listening to where we're at now Right. And the most recent episodes and starting from from the beginning. I think there were some things that I would have liked to play out a little bit more or I felt like I could have played out a little bit differently. I think one of the biggest things for me is probably the relationship with Orcus with Ephemia. Just because like we couldn't have that many big bads, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were not expecting the whole thing 
what is it thorn thorn why yeah. am i forgetting his name baby shadow thorn <laughs> baby shadow thorn she just stomps on him every time she walks past but i think just like how we did that worked best for the storyline i think because it, uh, it would have been too much yeah but also i think just for Ephemia herself and like i think i was relying so much on that for like some slow growth and then i was like oh crap <laughs> like, yeah what do i do now okay i'm like she at least met you know like kind of her aunt a little bit yeah but they're not like they haven't really gotten like close she more mm-hmm. so just relies on her for like some connection to her mom so yeah there were like a couple things where i feel like you know i wish i would have played out more maybe more scenes with cassidy um learning a little bit more of what was like going on in the background there it was fun like s- slowly learning the things that led yeah. up to like uh learning about the solar and everything for instance like meeting river she learned a ton of information from river that she hadn't gotten from cassidy and i get also it's just like a mix of timelines of when these people were involved but yeah so i think there were just like some conversations because you know me I'm, I'm much more into like the talking part right right <laughs> Yeah, I'm much more of a talker than I am at combat. Bless Cade, by the way, for anyone listening, <laughs> because I realize I sound so much better at D&D than I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so do I. <laughs> I think people are like, wow, that Cade, he's such a great DM. And it's like, I am a great editor. I'm an okay DM. <laughs> Marissa definitely knows how to count her rolls. Yeah, yeah. We'll say him, you know, I'll roll it. I'm like, guys, what's seven plus 19? I just, I need help. And then, you know, of course, Mason's there to say 26, but like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See, mine will be like, what am I even supposed to add to this? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm finally catching on. Hey, I I'm mean, getting there. <laughs> I mean, we're we're getting we're getting there. But I mean, as we're getting to that point, and you know, we, we like as the campaign's kind of winding down. What do you think about your character's kind of like resolution? Where do you see your character? Where where do you hope? I guess your character is going to get by the end of the campaign. I know that one of your big goals has been getting to be re- reunited with your mother. But are there other resolutions that you're hoping that Ephemia can kind of hit those checkpoints before the campaign comes to a close? I think, honestly, the the biggest one, like you pointed out, is her reconnecting with her mom. Right. Which honestly turned into much more of a pivotal moment than I expected. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really excited about that, actually, because I feel like that is going to be a really interesting close, you know, like maybe fighting alongside her mom or something along those lines, like having something that made all of the trials and tribulations worth it. Yeah. So as for things that I would like to close out, I think, um, and one thing Brooke and I have talked about a lot, but we didn't, again, want to force it, is like a legit friendship between Celine and Ephemia. Yeah. Then I think just like some sort of, I guess, not like, a, a you know, again, one major pivotal moment, but seeing that like after all of this is over, that she has a chance to move on with her life. Yeah. And because she's been carrying around all this weight from all of, you know, these heavy things in her life and getting to the point where I don't want to force a happy ending, but also I'm like, my girl deserves it. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I, I want her to have somewhat of a happy ending. So if her mom dies in front of her cage, <laughs> believe me, I've thought of every <laughs> way this can go. I know where you live. <laughs> I know where your bedroom is, Cade. <laughs> oh no, I've, I've shoved too much in my hand. <laughs> Blackmails me the rest of the campaign. <laughs> You'll see me asking for a lot more pens. <laughs> that was my favorite. That was one of my favorite. Like, why did Ophemia ask for a pen? <laughs> I love that. Because, like, I heard it and I just laughed and I didn't even think about the fact that you know nobody's Nobody gonna get knows it the context i've yeah. asked that many times but it usually gets cut out and so just hearing, i really need to need to know why you needed a pen <laughs> in the discord that was great <laughs> to write me notes <laughs> to, to throw frowny faces at Cade. your character's gone through kind of like a lot of changes like we've talked about like with orcus at the beginning and being a warlock and then being a warlock pact of the tarot disconnected from orcus and then now being a paladin there's just been lots of like ripping one way and another and i know that oh, yeah. put you through a lot <laughs> as a a newer D player in terms of like the gameplay mechanics i guess of your character 
with like abilities, spells, or skills, are there any that you wish that you would have acquired or focused more on during the game? Like things that you were like, oh, I wish I would have done this sooner, or oh, I wish, man, I just wish I could go back and play a fighter and crit on 19s and 20s like Mason, <laughs> you know? Like, is there anything that you think that you would have changed had you had the foresight that you have now? Partially, and ag- again, this is another thing that storyline I could not see a way that it would have made sense with the way we we were going right. but having Ephemia stay as a warlock I think would have been fun but also it, again it just stopped making sense yeah and there, there had to be there had to be a change I totally get that and I'm very excited to discuss more about what you thought of our campaign in the patreon after show but we are going to move on now to to Grom, our next interviewee. So let's get Mason in the room. So now we are joined here by Mason, who plays Grom in the second campaign of our podcast. Mason, how do you feel about your character's progress in the campaign so far? Are there any particular moments or milestones that you feel like are kind of like things that shaped Grom as a character? Um, yeah, no, I've, I've liked Grom's progression throughout the um, the campaign. I feel like he's had to face difficult situations and emotions. Um, and I mean, several times we even talked about him like going into a bit of a darker side with a barbarian right, right. Uh, subclass um, or multi-class uh, and different things like that. But like his friends have forced him to grow and advance. Um, so I would say as for like keystone and yeah, milestones, I would say uh, definitely the, the fight with the Drider, uh, the Bridesmaid of Darkness. Yeah, the yeah. Bridesmaid of Darkness. That experience in his hometown, um, I would say one thing is that when uh, Celine ended up killing his his bullies, his local yeah, bullies, yeah. I, I think that was a moment of growth for him in that uh, he recognized that like he didn't like these people, but he didn't necessarily want them to die. Yeah. And he may need to be cautious about the way he is uh, using violence to solve his problems. And then uh, one of my favorite personal moments that we had with him was after the fight with Edmund when uh, we had the whole shebang of us trying to get the money and escape Sparkel attacking us but uh, essentially him speaking out against Ascended Corp. Uh, my favorite line listening back or at least since I've uh, listened I haven't caught all the way up yet but one of my favorite lines listening back was the get out of here that he uh, yelled to the audience I think it I, I think that definitely like was the moment where he kind of took his role as like the champion of the people like yeah. uh, taking initiative to to keep these people safe get them out over attacking or and that had a huge impact on the campaign there was there was a whole narrative about what was going to happen to all of those people in that arena had you not gotten them out i'm talking like mech suits warfare and potential bringing up of the ending of the storyline with this cataclysmic event that could have happened had you not have done what you did in that arena I really do think that you kind of leaned into the champion subclass more than you even might have initially thought because we we had talked about you subclassing into or multi-classing into barbarian. Alec and I were talking about this not too long ago. It, one of my favorite things is that I think that Grom alone would have gone down like the yeah. angrier path towards like I solve conflict with violence. Yep. And because of you know the group i think you taking levels in cleric rather than taking levels in barbarian i think is very indicative of how uh grom's storyline has kind of progressed you know with like i heal things instead of needing to hurt things because healing the people i care about is more important than hurting the people that i dislike yep I really like that. Yeah. Um, and also, like, I've never used it before, uh, but one of the Grom's cantrips from that um, is Spare the Dying. Oh, so right. So that when, if someone accidentally gets, like, killed that yeah. we're not meaning to, he is able to, like, take that step back and, like, make sure we're Stabilize not going them. too far. Yeah. 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 So... Well, uh, which is especially good now that there's like undead coming back yeah, to life because yeah, exactly. it, it causes people not to go on und- undead for 10 days. That's awesome. You've had a lot of personal growth as a character. I'm interested in knowing, were there any storylines that you felt were kind of like missed moments that you thought like, ah, oh, man, I wish that I would have, I would have gone a little bit farther down that storyline because I think that Grom could have had a lot more personal growth from that. 
Yeah, I think his whole uniting the Underdark story, he hasn't played too much of a role in that. He is taking down like the evil champions of the Underdark and, and trying to rid the Underdark of the evil influences that are in it, but he hasn't like really worked with the people and tried to unite a community. It's just more fighting, which I don't think necessarily is like his or your fault by any means right. like we had different priorities as a party like yeah. we we couldn't go on a dungeon delve into the underdark because i needed to get to my fight we needed to save zag like we had a lot of different higher priorities going on totally that is one area that i think i've underplayed um even in my moments in the underdark i didn't do too much to interact with the people um or make a name for myself besides potentially like the the underdark fighting arena that yeah that happened yeah. but uh I mean, outside of that, there's been a lot of things that were televised on the Rune Crystal phones. You that's know? true. That's it's true. It's nice because even though they were bad for the sake of like Ascended Corp spying on you, also like you being the champion of Greyhaven, I would think that it w m probably has bolstered your people in seeing like if he can make it, then like we can make it yeah, too. Yeah, the, like, the image, just the image of him being successful and overcoming things. A very good leader for your people, as well as a champion. Speaking of kind of like you becoming this champion of your people, and we discussed it in a session today, as this campaign is kind of approaching and like winding down to the end, how do you see like your character's fate in the sense of like, do you think your party has what it takes to go the distance? Like for Danny and Alec and Marissa, I used a uh, one to 10 scale, one being we are going to TPK, 10 being this, like, it's going to be any other Thursday, we're going to walk all over these people. I would say, I think it's up in the air. Me as Mason is probably like six, maybe six, maybe seven. Yeah. Grom, actually, and I haven't, I haven't had the chance to play this out quite yet. Yeah. Um, this will be something that's more, as we get back to Greyhaven, um, I've talked to you about like specific role-playing things I want to do. The Grom has a lot of self-doubt. He sees that the task of uniting the Underdark is something um, that that's kind of above him. Like he, yeah. he, he feels a little overwhelmed and I mean, he's doing the best he can, but he does have a fear that it's, it's not going to be enough. And if it isn't enough, who else will, will be able to. Yeah. And so I'd say that for him, it's probably like a, a three to four. He knows that there's an evil that we have to face, but doesn't know exactly how it's going to turn out. There's been a, a mixture of numbers, uh, low and high, and I think it's interesting to think about you guys as players having the thought of the your likelihood of being able to win this versus like your character's thoughts of like, can we win this? Yeah. And like how the differentiation between those two numbers can kind of combat each other because it's like well i don't think we can win or i think we can win but my character doesn't or does you know well and, so. and me as a person knows that like it's a final battle you as the dm are going to make it difficult but not impossible right and so that's where i kind of get that number from is like i expect it to be hard just not not impossible you guys have taken a lot of good preparation because there is a uh, alternate universe out there where uh, evil dm Cade is like well you guys didn't prep enough for the final battle because vecna is a cr30 creature yeah you guys fought granny d cr20 at level 12 you guys crushed it very impressed with that however cr 30s a whole you know 10 steps up game, yeah i'm hoping though with the preparations you guys have taken with uh or wanting to reach out to the eight and gathering resources to expend at your will will make it so that a cr 30 creature will see a, seem a lot more manageable even not at a 20th level so um but speaking of like we've talked about multiple Multi-classing. We've talked about leveling up, but in terms of game mechanics and your own character's progression, were there any abilities, spells, or skills that you wish that your character had maybe acquired or focused more on? And how do you think that would have changed the story? For instance, had you not chosen to multi-class into cleric and instead had multi-class into something some a little more like optimal i guess what do you think you would have chosen and how would that have affected the storyline metagame wise barbarians and fighters go great together yeah. um, especially the um, originally what one of my thought processes was was the champion fighter mixed with i think it's zealot or berserker uh barbarian yeah i think it was berserker 
just because uh, with champion you get an increased critical range oh, and then with yeah. barbarian you get an increased critical damage um, yeah. and so they can go pretty hand, hand in hand yeah. speaking optimally that would have been how I could have built him but once again like I didn't think that the story required that um, there were times where it, it introduced its potential um, but we didn't go that direction just because it didn't feel right for my character totally. to do yeah and uh, but other than that like the one regret is uh, with the battle with Aserac if I had had my hammer I think we would have been able to do a decent amount more yeah and yeah but but at the same time not having my hammer I've, I've really liked yeah. kind of the the fluctuation between fist and hammer that he uses like to me it kind of shows that he earned the name iron fist like yeah. he's uh, uh, it doesn't matter if you have the hammer or not. You're still dealing a considerable amount of damage. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and and not only that, but just he is capable with or without a weapon. And uh, I think that's what... I, I really like that part of his character just because of like the champion subclass. Once again, I think it plays into that where it's like, yeah. it doesn't matter what weapon I have. It doesn't matter what. Like, I'm going to kick your butt. <laughs> like, that's, yeah. uh, that's, and I mean, you already roll high enough without the I do champion. I have very lucky rolls, yeah. Which is great. No, I love it. Because I think, honestly, you've picked a lot of things with Grom that I know that you wouldn't have had it been a different character, potentially. Like, like you probably would have wanted to make it more optimal had you because yeah. i know you you know the numbers you you know this game very well and which is awesome and i love the fact that you were like you know what tavern brawler is kind of a weird feat but it makes sense for my character yeah. and so with you picking up like tavern brawler it makes like grom just like you said like very versatile very fun like i i very much enjoyed how you've played grom i think it's been a very good great character Sorry to tag one last thing onto it. Uh, it's it's made him more fun. Um, oh, totally. Like I, I think that if I had chosen to just build optimally and stuff like that, it would have been forced. It would have been I don't know. It, it would have felt fake. Uh, yeah. Whereas with Grom, like he feels naturally built. Like like yes, he has his strengths. Yes, he has his weaknesses. But like those all feel natural and a part of his character rather than oh, he took this because it was just more optimal you know like i i feel like his experience that he's gained in the level ups he's been provided actually fit with the history and the story that he's he's in i completely agree i think that you've built grom in a very fun to listen to as well as fun to play for yourself character and i've really enjoyed getting to know grom more in this campaign and I think I'll save the rest of my questions for you for the after the show Patreon portion. And we're going to continue to our last interviewee, Brooklyn. And let's get Brooklyn in here really quick. I'm joined here by Brooklyn as our last interviewee for our pre-finale interview that we're doing today. So, hey Brooklyn, thank you for joining us. Hey! So, to kick things off, how do you feel about your character Celine's progress in the campaign so far? Are there any particular milestones or moments that you feel are kind of shaping to who your character is or character is becoming? I have felt really good about how much Selena's progressed as a character, just as far as hitting storyline points and having her change over time and just being a character with some amount of depth. That doesn't necessarily mean that things happened in a way I predicted or that I hit every mark that I had in mind when we began. Right. But I just think that she's had a lot of really good moments. I did not expect her character to have so much religious crises. <laughs> Which I'm not mad at. I, I liked that I enjoy it when you as a DM give me storyline that I wasn't planning on having necessarily. I've liked exploring who Selena is outside of her town that she grew up in because previous to the campaign starting, that's pretty much where she spent most of her time and hadn't really explored much outside of that. And then, of course, there's been like this moral battle of being a more violent character and right. and balancing that out a little bit as time goes on, which was also not really as... didn't really go as planned. I could really go on and on with plot points and, and storyline arcs that I feel like Selena's accomplished. I mean, I think you had a lot of really great story plot, plot moments prepared 
prior to the campaign and I really enjoyed kind of throwing those curveballs in to kind of help with your character progression beyond what you had already kind of had planned out for Celine before. Something that I think was a really big curveball to you as a character that I wanted to ask you a little bit more of was your relationship with the party changed in a lot of ways throughout the campaign, particularly with Grom. There is the one portion of the campaign where you attacked his like childhood bullies and that really had a big impact on him in a way that you didn't expect because of how he kind of seemed to deal with violence in his own aspects and I don't think you really thought that he was going to react to you using violence in a way that he disapproved of so I kind of wanted to get your perspective on what was going through your head when that happened what was going through Celine's head that situation was a defining moment for sure in my storyline and honestly in the campaign I didn't think it was going to be significant and It's interesting how I think things kind of stacked up a little bit. Even in the very first episode, me being called Butcher, that was not going to be my vibe. Like, I know I'm a rogue, but my whole plan was to go against the rogue stereotype. I didn't plan to be any kind of violent character, but then I ended up being... I, I want to, almost. Yeah, I want to say, well, I, I don't know, because the, the situation with um, Grom's childhood bullies, that wasn't necessarily typecast the way other people were seeing me. That was straight up my actions and so that's why i think part part of the reason why i think it was so defining is because there had been kind of some jokes and some signs about me being kind of a a more violent rogue and then all of a sudden there i was doing it you know and i i almost regret i don't know sometimes i i feel bad about how that went because i wasn't trying to be a super crazy murder hobo character But I really was trying to be thoughtful in that episode, and I was trying to act the way I feel like Salim would act. But I don't know. I I, I have probably the most mixed feelings about that episode than any other episode. Right. You bring up a good point in the fact that that wasn't a plot point that you were expecting to happen. I'm wondering if there were other plot points that you thought may have happened during the campaign that you might have missed or like you wish that you would have delved deeper into that plot point to establish it or explore that more yeah so my big point of conflict at the beginning of this campaign was my parents and how they had died and me discovering that they weren't good people and that there were deeper rooted issues going on with Lathander and everything and I don't know exactly what I necessarily expected because that plot point was resolved, but I just feel like there, I I thought that it was going to last for a lot longer and be a bigger part of the overarching storyline somehow. And I do think that in every campaign, I take a little while to warm up to knowing who my character is and role playing and everything. So I do feel like partially just due to my own fault it kind of was something that got swept up under the rug a little bit how would you like to have seen that be unfolded then like if you could go back and say hold up Cade don't just like sweep over this what would your like perfected view of how your parents storyline would have gone first I just want to point out I don't put this on you at all I honestly think that it was mostly just on me and my role play decisions and my communication with you on kind of how that played out. But if I could go back, I would first of all communicate more with my party what was going on and my fears and my goals. Those are the kinds of things you try to figure out as a player. But I think it is way underestimated how important it is just to tell your party, you know, find a way to bond and just share parts of yourself because otherwise it's just this hidden thing that you know about, but your table doesn't know about your DM might not even know about it. And for us, like the podcast listeners might not know about it. And so I just think it's worth kind of getting out there and just saying it, I think that would have helped it be a bigger part of the story and something that the whole party was a little more aware of. Right. And then I just wish I was a little more vulnerable. I mean, this is, this is for literally all the time, everything. 
but I wish I was a little more vulnerable with role play and being expressive about that because that that's a big deal. Like if my parents died when I was in my 20s, that would be a big deal. If I found out they weren't great people, that would be a big deal. If that also simultaneously made my religious beliefs crumble, that would be a big deal. Yeah. And I feel like I, I probably didn't show that nearly enough in my emotional role play. I think that that is something that is, I mean, heart, it's a skill to have in D&D to be that emotionally available through a character and I think that that is something that you I know have been working on and I'm excited to see how it plays out with your campaign 3 character speaking of campaign 3 though this second campaign we both know it it's approaching its close it's approaching the end the final battle what are your thoughts and emotions about your character's potential fate with the final battle like uh i guess i i phrased this in the way for everyone else on a scale of one to ten one being we're going to tpk ten being this is going to be a total cakewalk at the end what do you think your party's chances are of surviving this final battle oh man i I, (laughs) this feels like an impossible question because this is similar to campaign one in the way that at the end we're rallying a bunch of people it's a massive war And so I don't know from your perspective how it's going to go as far as who are we fighting? How many people are we fighting? How many people are actually around us? Like, what does our actual initiative look like? And is there going to be multiple waves? So are we going to have to spread out our resources a little bit or are we just throwing it all at the wall? I truly feel like I can't guess, but if you're twisting my arm for it, I'm going to say like a three. One being harder, right? right? One being like you are going, it's impossible. Like you're going to die. Sure, sure. We'll go with three. (laughs) With your answer being a three, are there anything that you, with the foresight that you have now, is there anything that happened during the campaign that you think could have upped your odds to a three to maybe closer to a 10 or a 10 if you could even uh, have had that be an option? I'm probably missing some obvious stuff here. I feel like our listeners could probably critique how to make my character stronger better than I could. Oh, the Discord has has many fan theories about about everything that you guys have done. I love the the analyses that we get. Yes, for sure. But it, the one thing I can think of would maybe be multi-classing. I stuck with Rogue all the way through. Right. Everybody else had some class switch-ups and multi-classing and everything. And I, I do feel like that would have made me stronger had I been smart with my multi-classing. But I just, at the end of the day, I wanted Selene to be a straight Rogue. So I don't really regret that. But as far as combat goes and different kinds of perks, that probably would have helped. That's an interesting point. Well, Brooke, I'm going to save the rest of these questions for our after the show interview. So thank you for joining me here and we will see you in an hour or so. Thank you all so much for joining us for this pre finale campaign interview. If you are part of our Patreon, stay tuned. In just a few seconds here, we're going to be continuing with the secondary portion of this interview. But if you're not part of our Patreon, thank you for listening. And if you would like to check out the second portion of this interview, you can go to patreon.com forward slash knocked and subscribe for as little as $2 a month to hear the rest of this interview. Thank you so much for listening to Knocked Prone. And we hope you remember when life knocks you flat on your back. All you got to do is keep rolling. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.